change chromatography is one of the main methods that we use to purify proteins, and it separates proteins based on their charge. The terminology can get kind of confusing, so here's an overview. There are two main forms of ion exchange chromatography, cation exchange and anion exchange. So remember that ion is just a word for a charged thing, and we can talk about cations, which are positively charged, and anions, which are negatively charged. And if you have a salt, that's going to be a neutral combination of ions. So in sodium chloride, our typical table salt, we have sodium ions and chloride ions. If we're dealing with cation exchange, we're dealing with a cationic protein that is a positively charged protein. We often call these proteins basic because they contain a lot of those basic amino acids, lysine, arginine, histidine, ones that can be positively charged. If we're dealing with anion exchange, we're dealing with a negatively charged, that is anionic protein. We often call these types of proteins acidic because they have a lot of what we call the acidic amino acids, things like glutamate and aspartate. Remember, we classify things as basic or acidic based on their neutral state. So in their neutral state, histidine, lysine, and arginine act as bases, take on a proton, and become positively charged. This is why we call such um, positively charged proteins basic. With our acidic amino acids, aspartate and glutamate, well, in their neutral form, they act as acids. They're neutral when, they, when then they give up a proton, so now they become negatively charged. So we call proteins that have a negative charge um, acidic. When we're dealing with ion exchange, we take advantage of the relative charges of proteins in order to separate different proteins based on the differences in their charges. Because remember, a protein is going to be made up of a lot of amino acids. Some of them are going to be protonatable, some of them are going to be basic, some of them are going to be acidic, and a lot of them are going to be neutral. And so different combinations of amino acids will lead to different, different charges. And then that charge is going to depend on the pH and this is going to be reflected in the property called the PI. So remember that the PI is the isoelectric point, it's the pH at which a multiprotic molecule is net neutral. So remember for each acid site, we can be talking about a pKa. And so when we're talking about the, um, the relative strength, the acidity of different amino acid side chains, we can use the term pKr, if we go back to thinking about acids as cookie monsters, where then the pKa's have the strength of a single cookie monster, but then remember in our protein, we have a bunch of cookie monsters lined up and some of them are gonna be acids and some of them are going to be bases. And therefore the overall charge of the protein is going to depend on the relative makeup of the protein in terms of how many acids and how many bases they have and what the pH is. Because remember at a lower pH, there's going to be more protonation and therefore things are going to be more positively charged. At a higher pH, there's gonna be fewer protons so less things are going to be protonated, and so you're going to have a negative charge. So remember that pKa tells us about protonation and deprotonation, not about charge. But the isoelectric point, that tells us about charge. Because the isoelectric point, that is the point at which the protein is net neutral overall. So if we have a protein and we want to use it in its positively charged form, we want to use it to take advantage of its cationic nature, we need to make sure that it's actually cationic. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that our pH is going to be below the pI, so below that isoelectric point. So if we have a basic protein, we want to use cation exchange chromatography, and we need to be below the pI. Okay, so what if we have one of those acidic proteins? What if we have one that has a lot of those acidic residues, those glutamates and those aspartates? In this case, we wanna take advantage of its negativeness. And so in order to make sure that it's negative, we need to be above the PI. So remember, above the P at a pH above the PI, there's gonna be fewer protons around, so you're gonna have less protonation, and therefore you're going to have a net negative charge because you are the isoelectric point is referring to the neutral point and not referring to a single site protonating or deprotonating. And then different proteins are going to have different PIs because they're going to have different makeups of amino acids. So if we want to separate proteins, we can take advantage of their different charges by using ion exchange chromatography. So remember cation exchange is going to be exchanging your positively charged, that is cationic protein, 
four um, cation, salt cations on the resin. And then anion exchange chromatography is going to be exchanging your negatively charged or anionic protein for the, the anion um, so from the salt on the resin. So you're going to have oppositely charged resin. So in the case of cation exchange, your protein is cationic, but your resin is anionic. So your resin is negatively charged. So your positively charged protein will stick. But your protein, so your protein will stick. But the stuff that's not charged or um, the stuff that has a negative charge, the stuff that's not as positively charged is going to kind of flow through. And if you use salt, um, what's going to happen if you add a bunch of salt? Well, now what's going to happen is the salt ions, the cations in the salt, so that sodium in your sodium chloride, say, is going to start competing your protein off of the beads. So you're exchanging your protein for those salt cations. And this is going to allow you to then isolate your protein after you've washed off other things. In the case of anion exchange, you have a negatively charged anionic protein. Remember, we often call these acidic. We're going to have positively charged cationic resin. So our protein is going to be attracted to the resin. It's going to stick to the resin, whereas things that are positively charged or things that aren't very charged um, are going to flow through. And when we add a high salt, that the, the anions in the salt, so the chloride in our sodium chloride is going to compete off our protein. We're going to exchange our anionic protein for the anions in the salt. There are a couple of ways to do this. Um, you, could also, you could also change the pH in order to change the protein's charge, but typically we use salt um, because it's easier and it's less, um, it's less likely to kind of cause issues with your protein. Um, if you're changing the pH, that can cause problems because the protein kind of likes a certain pH typically. One of the ways that we could do this is using a salt gradient elution. So remember, elution is just when we're like pushing something off of the column. We're getting something to come off. We're getting something to elute. If we use a salt gradient, well, here the least oppositely charged thing's going to come off first, and then as you gradually increase the salt concentration, your most oppositely charged thing comes off last. And this would be good if you have um, a bunch of things in your mixture, all with different PIs, and you kind of need to isolate them all, and you're not sure how much salt your protein is going to take to push off. But typically, this is going to require one of those fancy machines in order to do a gradient. And so often, what we're doing is just like a stepwise elution. So in a stepwise elution, we basically go from like a low salt concentration to a higher salt concentration and then an even higher salt concentration. Or we can just do a single step where we start with um, low salt and then raise the concentration um, to get our molecule to elute. But when you're not when you're doing a gradient, you're able to kind of have a finer separation of things, whereas here is kind of more like things that barely bound um, are going to get removed. And then like everything that was kind of bound similarly is going to get removed when you have that high salt. So in cases where you have a protein with like a really high PI or a really low PI, um, then you can take advantage of that to be able to, they'll bind stronger. And so it'll take more to compete them off. Um, but in most cases, you're going to get not very pure if you were to try to start with this with the ion exchange. And so often you're going to start with some sort of affinity chromatography if you're able to, such as if your protein has a tag. And remember, in each of these cases, you're going to need to make sure that your protein really is cationic if you're using cation exchange, or your protein really is anionic if you're using anion exchange. And so in order to ensure that, we need to keep track of where the pH is in comparison to the isoelectric point, the pi. If we want our protein to be positively charged, if we want to use cation exchange, we need to be at a lower pH. And if we want to use anion exchange, we want our protein to be negatively charged, we need to use a higher pH. Um, you can look up the PI for different proteins using various software like XBASE Proc Param. And this can be linked directly from the Uniprot entry, which is where like, you can find out information about different proteins. Um, and there's some other tools that we'll go into later. Um, but that's the basics is you can look up the computed PI and go from there. But also note that sometimes proteins are weird and even though they might not behave exactly like what their PI predicts, remember those PIs are going to be based on like isolated amino acids, um, whereas we're dealing with in the context of a whole protein. And also we have to think about what's actually going to be binding to the resin is not like the whole protein as a 
bulk, just like it's not like it's the resin is going to see one charge. It's going to see patches of charge on the protein and bind to those patches. So even if your protein is basic, it might not bind very well to the um, to your cation exchange resin, and it might even bind to the anion exchange resin. And proteins are really weird sometimes. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the technical details of the lab stuff, but I have other videos if people really want to know those details. But bottom line, positively charged protein, cationic, use cation exchange. How do you know if your protein is positively charged? You want to be below the PI. And so you want your protein to have a high PI. You want your protein to be basic. They're going to be below at a pH below the PI, and you're going to use cation exchange chromatography. If your protein's acidic, if it has a low PI, you're going to want to be above that PI in terms of your pH, and you're going to want to use anion exchange chromatography. And with either of these, you're going to be exchanging that protein that's bound to the resin to salt ions. And that is the basis of ion exchange chromatography.